whichever way you look, it's a crowded world. Crowds going to work, crowds going to play, crowds going home, crowds going away. Tired crowds, hungry crowds, thirsty crowds. Small crowds only waiting to be bigger crowds. And if that's not enough, crowds of animal, vegetable and mineral pushing their way into the picture, claiming their standing room. And all on the move. Every day, every night, through every 52 weeks of the year, all calling for transport. Transport, a many-sided industry and one of the largest in the country. Like any other industry, it needs people to keep it going. Hundreds of thousands of them. And every week it needs hundreds more. But what do all these people do? Let's have a look at some of these jobs in British transport. Take something we all know. Buses and the people who work in them. There's the conductor. Half the time he's a booking clerk and cashier. Half the time he's the father of a large family of passengers. And think of those bus drivers too taking their double-deck buses through all that traffic. Yes, but as far as keeping transport going, there's many will tell you the real job's done in the maintenance sheds. If buses were breaking down every five minutes, you'd never get anywhere, as you might say. You've got to keep those engines tuned sweeter than a fiddle, so you have chaps whose job it is to do nothing else. It's not only a matter of tuning engines, though, or making sure the chassis won't fall to pieces. There are the mucky jobs as well. Every so often, every vehicle, whether it's a bus or a tube train, has to be stripped down and scrubbed, cleaned, until it's fit to travel in again. Now, there's a job that's not the same as it was. They're bringing in so much machinery nowadays that the art of hand scrubbing's being lost, so to speak. Of course, there's still a lot of dirty work about, but these days, even cleaning's becoming a highly mechanised business. Yes, mechanisation's a big word in modern transport. I've been a railwayman for over 40 years, and I've seen many changes. Track maintenance, for instance. There's always been as much brute force as craft in that job. Now, it's being speeded up and some of the brute force is giving way to machine power. Though you can't call it work for weaklings. There's cleaning ballast, too. Once, every bit had to be shoveled out, sieved, and shoveled back. These lads are working a machine that does the whole operation all in one go. And there's track laying. Slogging work that's always been. For we used to have to assemble each new section as we went along. Mechanization and pre-assembled track made a big alteration to that. But we hadn't half enough of these machines. Can't get the material, for one thing. And some of them aren't rightly out of the experimental stage. Like this tamping machine, for tucking ballast under sleepers. Still, we're on the move in this job. There's hardly a day, but we're having a go at some new development. Well, for that sort of thing, come over to the research side. Besides having to test all kinds of materials used in transport, we are continually developing new instruments to dig out basic facts. Now here, we are testing out an engine. It's a question of efficiency and reliability as well as speed. How much power can this engine produce for a certain amount of coal? What are its most economical speeds? That sort of thing. In this 
case, we are checking drawbar pull against different valve settings. The idea being roughly to get the last ounce of pull out of every puff. The steam engine's a good old horse, but we have to be ready for a new look in locos. A few years back, railways decided to develop this diesel electric effort. It uses a 16-cylinder deformed diesel to drive an electric generator. That produces current to drive six traction motors, and these have a go at driving the wheels. But that's not the only bright idea. There's the gas turbine, which is a sort of half-brother to the jet. And here's another interesting effort, the diesel mechanical. No need to generate current, just a very natty differential gearbox, and the power goes straight to the wheels. Yes, but any of the backroom boys will tell you that going ahead isn't confined to one or two sections. Public demand is always changing. And to cope with it, the entire transport industry has to keep moving. Just how many rows of draftsmen are needed, I wonder, to work out all the new plans required? A new factory springs up. That means new sidings. Or a new steelworks may mean new marshalling yards. And a new town will certainly want new stations. Aye, but what always strikes me about transport is the teamwork. Take one of these new schemes. Right from the start, architects, engineers and surveyors are practically looking through each other's eyes. But all their plans will be worthless without the men who do the actual work. The teams that clear the site, the lads who do any preliminary building necessary, the engineering boys. I, when we built this bridge at Raynham and Kent, it was really something to see those squadrons of cranemen and mechanics Welders and fitters, electricians and track layers going into action. Just like a team on the sports ground. You know, that's the advantage behind the playing fields. It brings out the team spirit. Work or play. Remember the electrification scheme from Liverpool Street to Shenfield? No doubt about the teamwork behind that. We'd to change 25 route miles over from steam to electric traction without interruption to normal services. And it was not just a matter of putting up bridge structures and stringing cable along. We had track layers altering the lines. We had civil engineers widening bridges. We had builders erecting six electric substations and electrical engineers installing them with transformers and rectifiers. And then the war came along. But we still got the job through by 1949. Aye, that was something to be proud of. And when the scheme was formally opened and the first train was away, well, you can be sure the team was all there to see it out. British transport, you're in a team that gives you a say in the way things are run. At these big regional conferences, the chaps really get up on their hind legs. But out of all their criticisms and complaints come the constructive suggestions. And that's what the team's after. Because the men in the British transport team are behind every industry in the country. Every year in Britain, we mine over 200 million tonnes of coal. But without the men to move it to the gas works and power stations, steel works and factories, we might as well leave it where it is. And you've only to ask yourself, how would you get your food if it wasn't for the men in transport?
Thousands of trucks, every kind of load from shirt buttons to bulldozers, and hundreds of different destinations. Every day, 11,000 trucks come to this marshalling yard alone. They could never be sorted out if it wasn't for these chaps. The shunters. The men who think nothing of running a marathon twice over every day, they round up the trucks for the next stage of their journey. There'll be tractors for export, and there'll be cars, machinery, jet engines, chemicals. But without the men to move the stuff to the docks and get it away, it wouldn't bring in a packet of cigarettes. We send stuff out, we bring stuff back. At the British transport docks at Hull, our chaps are unloading timber. In our other docks, perhaps at Southampton or Cardiff, Middlesbrough or Grangeburg, they may be landing wool, wheat, iron ore, rubber, petrol, or nylons and tobacco. And then someone has to get all those safely away into the factories and shops. Transport is the bloodstream of our industry, and the men, like corpuscles, are constantly moving the nourishment to wherever it's wanted. And what does all this teamwork come down to? The man on the job. The individual man doing his job with efficiency and responsibility. Yeah, that's what I wanted when I came out of the forces. A bit of individual responsibility. So, I tried long distance lorry work. And I reckon I've got what I want. I'm usually out on my own. Then it's up to me to look after my load and get there on schedule. All the same, if I do get stuck in the woods, or the guts start dropping out of my engine, I know the old transport team's there to give me a hand. Boatmen have a similar sort of job too. I come across them now and again, <laughs> and they certainly don't have nursemaids. It's a case of, there's your cargo, you load it, and you get it there. You know, you can always find individual responsibility, but where else do you get so much of it combined with so much teamwork? Take any long distance train trip. For example, say, one with the British Railways boat journey at the end of it. There are the control room lads to start with. Now it's their job to watch how trains are keeping up with timetables. And if there's a delay anywhere, they have to see that it doesn't block the paths of other trains. On the train itself, it's the guard who's in charge, while the driver and fireman are responsible for getting a move on, as it were. But, you know, it's not just a case of opening up the regulator. There are signals to look for and a track to be watched every inch of the way. There's another thing. Fast trains need a fast, safe track and a good system of sending messages. And that's where track layers and communications people come in. And we mustn't forget the signalman. In his signal box, he's in command, just as much as the driver on his footplate or the cross-channel skipper on his bridge. Just take those three. Each man with individual responsibility for a big job. And though they may never see each other, they're all working together inside the transport team to get all these people to Calais. Have your landing tickets ready, please. Well, what comes most to my mind is training. To take responsibility in a team, You've got to be trained, and transport makes sure of that. It's not only the bare essentials, like the best way to clip tickets, or how to keep four wheels on the ground. The drivers have to know how the wheels go round too. Then, if they do have a breakdown, they're not completely helpless. 
And then there's the thousands of others in transport. In canteens and restaurants, for instance. The people at the counter, as well as those in kitchens and bakeries, all have to be trained. There's some valuable stuff in transport, besides its own property. There are the goods in depots, marshalling yards, wagons and trucks. All have to be guarded. To do that job, transport has its own police force. There's a learn-as-you-earn system as well, in signal boxes all over the country. While the old hands are setting the paths for the trains coming through, you'll see young lads, box boys, keeping a record of every move that's made. They're learning the system. Later, they'll be doing the signaling. And that's not all. You're encouraged to study in transport. In some jobs, just by passing certain outside exams, you can get as much as 50 pounds a year extra pay. And then there's transport's opportunity classes for those who are climbing the promotion ladder. People who've started right at the bottom, in many cases. Talking about blokes working their way up from the bottom reminds me of young Sammy Brown. He came on the railways as a cleaner. He knew that cleaning was one of the best ways to learn about engines, as well as being a jolly important job. How can anyone see a flaw if it's all covered up with muck? I first met Sammy when I was swatting up for my driver's exam. He had a boiler full of keenness, and you didn't have to be long-sighted to see he'd go pretty far. Well, Sammy got on to firing, and just as soon as he could, he took his test and was a full-blown fireman. Pretty soon after that, I had a bash at my driving test. They gave me a pretty stiff medical to see that my eyes and tubes were all right. Then, I had to prove that I knew my tubes and valves on engines. Finally, they gave me a real do on the track. I passed all right. Well, anyway, I lost sight of Sammy for quite a time. But some years later, I heard he was driving too. He's a deputy foreman now in a loco shed. And I'll bet he'll get to be a shed master before he's finished. Opportunities, opportunities. Everybody looking for opportunities. And if young lads want to see what there is in transport, well, that's always being arranged. And there's always room for new blood, of the right kind. If lads come into transport as soon as they leave school, they've every chance of a good place in a good team. Supposing a young chap's technically minded, well, at Derby, the railways have a technical training school. But they don't take everybody. They pick their trainees for this place. But once a young lad does get in, he's got his foot on a first-class ladder. Industries come, industries go. Transport goes on. Now, atomic power is going to change things. Well, transport will change with them. Because people will always need transport. And transport will always need people. They'll have to be trained. Technicians don't grow on cabbage sticks. And once we've trained people, we try to keep them in the family. In places like this one at Derby, after a year's first class training, these lads will go into the workshops as trade apprentices. Those that show promise, may be selected for promotion, or even an engineering apprenticeship. That means technical college classes, and perhaps an engineering degree. But whatever happens, wherever they are, whether it's rail, road, canals, docks, or ships, young chaps coming into the transport family 
will get a real kick out of their jobs. They can bet their best pair of football boots on that. And jolly good luck to them. <laughs>